In many parts of the world, children enjoy sanitized rewrites of ancient folk tales and nursery rhymes with sinister origins. Animals with distinctly human failings are used to explain away behavior rooted in the questionable morality of the past and lingering traces of bizarre behavior are attributed to the influence of otherworldly magic. Japan is no different. In this episode, we'll lift the veil and peer into the deep, dark origins of some of the country's most well-known folk tales. Prepare for a seasonal helping of seedy, cruel, and occasionally downright ugly folk horror. It goes without saying that this is not an episode you should share with children and vulnerable. And if you're of a nervous or sensitive disposition, look away now. Isanboshi, the Inch High Samurai. The creaking of their old wooden house reminds a childless couple that time is creeping up on them. In the flickering light of a paper lantern, night after night, they pray to the local spirits to give them a child. When the happy day finally comes, the baby is no bigger than your little finger. Like the European stories of Tom Thumb, Isanboshi is the tale of an impossibly tiny young boy who dreams of becoming a samurai in a boat made from a rice bowl. He puddles towards the capital of Kyoto with a chopstick. With its pale-faced geisha and cathedral-sized temples, the national seat of power is more inspiring than he could ever have imagined. He decides to choose the grandest estate and present himself as just another spirited youth seeking loyal service. The Lord is impressed, employing him as a guard and playmate for his daughter. Of course, she's beautiful and kind in a Disney princess kind of way. Because that's the way these tales go. One dark night, a band of demons swarm into the capital, seeking to kidnap every beautiful virgin they can lay their claws on. During his brave effort to protect the princess, Isanboshi is swallowed by the demon king but continues to slash and jab at his insides with his needle sword. Vomiting up the pint-sized warrior, the demon king leads a hasty retreat, leaving behind a magic hammer. When the princess wields the hammer, Isanboshi magically transforms into the kind of tall, handsome prince you would expect in a Thor movie. Not blonde, but you know, buff. On the face of it, a formulaic parable that hammers home the value of courage and perseverance with a dubious promise that you can leave disability and difference behind to marry a rich heiress. But dig a little deeper, and a much more sinister tale emerges. In the original source, Isanboshi is cast out by his cold-hearted parents, who with advancing age, find him just too spooky and unsettling. He sets out for Kyoto, in search of beautiful women, ingratiating himself with self-deprecating humor. 
a feudal lord, finds him amusing, and employs him as a kind of court jester. Although he humors the young man by calling him a samurai in turn, realizing that it's going to need more than the occasional size joke to take his master's daughter into bed, he steals grains of holy rice from the family altar and quietly arranges them around the mouth of the sleeping princess. In the morning, he squeals that she has eaten the rice which had offered to the gods, prompting her father to want to kill her. A good excuse to avoid the steep cost of a dowry one would imagine. Isanboshi appeases his feudal master long enough to smuggle her out of the house and into a boat to safety. But a storm blows them off course and they wash up on an isolated island inhabited by demons with a history of gang rape. Somehow, the rest follows, the tall, handsome, and sharp, happy every after formula, with a bit of gentle hammering. After the Second World War, Isenboshi actually made the miraculous transformation, from abusive lecher, to demon-slaying superhero. There was no social imperative for the innocence of the rice-stealing princess to be established in the 14th century original. And during the Edo period, 1603 to 1868, the tale was recommended as an essential component of the dowry at arranged marriage meetings. After all, the mendacious lust of a tiny-minded man is marginally preferable to demonic gang rape. Once upon a time, women were clearly expected to be thankful for small mercies. Momotaro The Peach Boy This is one of the most famous folk tales of all time. Yet again, we have a childless elderly couple. Perhaps, the creators of these tales had a premonition full of contemporary Japanese news headlines about falling birth rates and an aging population. In this one, a baby boy explodes fully formed from a giant peach. The wife fishes out of the river they name him Momotaro, and before he has a chance to chase off to Kyoto in search of sexual conquest, a familiar band of demons begin tearing up the local town. His father made a flamboyant clothes to motivate him. His mother rustles up a batch of millet dumplings, and off he goes. They didn't give him a magical sword or a demon-slaying club, you notice. On the way, Momotaro recruits a ragtag mercenary army by bribing a dog, a monkey, and a pheasant with dumplings. They pursue the demons to their isolated island, beats them, and return triumphant with enough treasure for everyone to live happily ever after. Or at the very least, afford a better class of misery. In the 16th century original, the couple regain their youth by eating a peach. And Momotaro is the natural product of celebratory sexual congress. Under the influence of Chinese mythology, Peaches had been associated with rejuvenation and immortality since ancient times. In 
In the original tale, the doting mother takes things a step further and goes beyond anything D.H. Lawrence could imagine by seducing her son. Together, mother and son attempt to kill the old man, but he is protected by the local deity and things get messy. They fall back on sympathetic black magic, sacrificing a dog, a monkey, and a pheasant, to gain demonic power. After successfully murdering the head of the household, the eldritch pair live happy ever after. At a time, when fratricide and incest were commonplace, this was probably little more than a risque tale to while away long, dark winter evenings, until spring arrived and lovers of all sorts could tumble in the fallen peach blossom once more. Click, clack, mountain. Long, long ago, in a remote mountain village, Yes, you guessed correctly. An old man and his wife. No, wait. An old woman and her husband were being tormented by a badger. They contrived a plan to catch it. But once the badger was tightly bound and safely in custody, he persuaded the old woman to loosen his bonds. Pushing her down, he ran from house and escaped into the night. When the old man returned home, he found his wife still on the ground, injured and unable to move. Rabbit, who was good friends with the old couple, decided to exact revenge on the badger. Asking for his help to carry firewood. The rabbit took out a flint and steel and striking it over the badger's back. Click, clack. Set his bundle of grass on fire. When the badger asked about the noise, she lied. Click clack bird, from click clack mountain, made the noise. The badger burns were so severe, that the very next day, he agreed to let the rabbit spread ointment, on his back. Instead, she applied red pepper. This is not the end of her revenge. She invited the badger to go fishing and let him in a mud boat, forcing him to leap into the river and beg for mercy. The rabbit agreed on condition that he pleaded for forgiveness from the old woman. Here we have the long-eared symbol of cleverness devotion, self-advancement, and good fortune, delivering a cruel lesson to the poor, wily vagabond. A cuddly form of class warfare perhaps. In an earlier version, the badger beats the old deer to death with a pestle, and the rabbit places a lucky foot on his head to hold him underwater, then drags his sodden corpse back to the old man. After all, the badger has committed a grievous sin against his conjugal property. But go back further, and the badger is a human moneylender, and the rabbit is a vengeful young woman whose mother committed suicide. In keeping with European medieval morality tales that warn against the sin of usury, 
and celebrate the virtue of women who commit suicide after being sexually assaulted. The woman commits suicide after being forced to provide sexual favors in return for an unpayable debt. Her daughter seduces the moneylender and coerces money from him. On a trip to the mountains, she asks him to gather firewood to light a reverential fire in honor of the divine spirit of the peak. With less fur and a few more salacious implications, the severe burns and stinging pepper application are much the same. But the river is replaced by an inviting bed. Feigning modesty, the girl insists on turning out the lights. The moneylender fails to notice that the object of his lust has been replaced by a poor prostitute, riddled with syphilis, and dies a short time later, of a virulent infection. The Monkey and Crabs Our next murky tales involves a monkey who pleads with a crab to trade a rice ball for a persimmon seed. The monkey's argument goes something like that charity gambit of give a man a fish and he'll feed his family for day. But give him a fishing rod, blah blah. So the crab goes for the deal, plants the seed, and looks forward to a plentiful supply of fresh fruit to feed her offspring. But when the seedling finally grows into a mature tree bursting with fruit, she realizes she has no way to harvest it. She asks the monkey to help, but instead, he climbs the tree and helps himself, before flinging an especially large, unripe fruit at the crab that cracks her shell and kills her. The distress of the baby crabs is answered by a bee, a chestnut, a millstone, and fresh patch of cow dung. They hatch a plan for revenge. The chestnut leaps out of a brazier, burning the monkey, who is stung by the bee when he rushes outside and tries to cool his face in the well. He steps back in surprise and slips on the dung before the millstone slides off the roof and crushes him. Of course he survives. This is, after all, the kid's version. He apologizes, they all make up and live happily ever after. Except the bee, of course, who is now dead after using his sting. A noble bit of inspiration for sacrificial kamikazes having second thoughts. The earliest recorded version sticks with the unconventional cast, but changes substantially once the monkey is under the millstone. Gasping for breath, he loses his head to a gaggle of baby crabs with sharp pincers. Even so, it ends with the familiar trope that everyone lived happily ever after. Remember that throughout Japanese history, but most especially during the Edo period of the samurai dictatorship, avenging blood relatives and clan leaders was considered the absolute height of life. Romantic notions of noble samurai persist, but as such tales make clear, their moral sentiments are on a par with feuding, cousin marrying, offensively stereotypical mountain hicks. After all, 
those shamisen, the geisha strum, are pretty much the same as a banjo. The Gratitude of the Crane Kindly old man, devoted wife, isolated old house. Need I say more? This time, the old fella comes across a crane caught in a trap and releases it. A short while later, a pale and interesting young woman washes up on their doorstep, claiming to be lost. They invite her in and feed her hot gruel with the last remnants of their rice supply. It appears she has nowhere to go and they invite her stay indefinitely. Finding there is no food in the house, when she wakes up early to make a thank you breakfast for the couple. Instead, the curious young woman greets them with a rich roll of brocade, made from thread she found in a basket. The proceeds from selling the brocade ensure they will all eat well for the rest of the week. Their peculiar house guest makes the couple promise never to peek into the room when she sets about weaving more brocade for sale. But with each sunrise, she appears thinner and paler. One night, the old man can no longer resist and peeks through a crack in the door. And yes, you guessed it. What he sees is the crane plucking feathers from her body to weave into the brocade. After transforming briefly back into a young woman, the crane eventually takes flight, pausing only to accept the thank you gift of an ornate comb from the old man with her long beak. The stuff of classic fairy tales with a touch of Orpheus mythology. Some who saw our videos of Japanese mythology would also notice the similarity. In this case, the original is perhaps by far the darkest our tales. One day, a man comes across a pale, beautiful young woman crying on the river bank. Her mother-in-law bullies her for being infertile and she is contemplating suicide. Spotting an opportunity, the man takes her back to the house, where he lives with his own mother. Sex and death follows. After inheriting the house, the man stops working and starts drinking heavily. Pretty soon, the couple are pursued by debt collectors on a daily basis. The young woman begins slipping out of the house in the early evening, returning each morning with cash to pay off their debts. Curious, he follows her one night to a local brothel and sees her greeting a customer. She notices him, and he runs away. But the amount of money grows and grows, until one morning, she simply doesn't return. Fearing the worst, he goes to the brothel to look for her, and the owner hands him an IOU for a huge sum of money. He gives up drinking and begins working again, but can barely afford to maintain the interest payments necessary to save him from violent bodily harm. And there, the story leaves him under a dark, cloudy sky, begging to be told where he went wrong. The crane has always been a fertile symbol of success and good fortune in Japanese culture. 
origami cranes are still thought to be a way to make your heart's desire come true. But I guess, if your heart is black and cold, you will pimp your good fortune until it becomes a millstone around your neck. Perhaps, what we have here is another loaded moral parable aimed at the mercenary owners of brothels. The Yukaku established to cater to those samurai nobles whose sexual interest didn't extend to their comrades. What may at first seem like a tall tale woven with feathery hypocrisy makes perfect sense. When you consider that merchants were becoming far more lucrative customers for the nation's pleasure quarters. Of course, that didn't stop the ruling elite taking their cut. Like Japan's much heralded history of bravery, honor, loyalty, and lofty daring do. Folk tales with truly horrific origins have been cleaned up to serve as educational tools for impressionable young minds. As an antidote to the threat of Christianity, the violent campaign against this invasive faith was aided by the arrival of Confucianism, that bureaucratic form of high snobbery that still dominates ethical discussion and props up notions of reverence for morally bankrupt elites. After all, history's most terrifying monsters are not anthropomorphized cow dung or vengeful bunnies, but frightened human beings. Thank you for watching till the end. And to guys who give us comments regularly, your comments are very encouraging. Thank you very much. Let us know. If you enjoy this channel's occasional forays into the dark side. And will consider making more. Or check out our sister channel. Where you can hear more about these tales. And learn basic Japanese language skills at the same time.